The Real Conflict Between Armenia and Azerbaijan One of the longest standing frozen conflicts in the world has thawed into a hot fight, leading to over 350 deaths and possibly prompting world powers to join the battle, which could make a lethal situation even worse. Armenia and Azerbaijan have revived their 32-year struggle over Nagorno-Karabakh, a mountainous region of 150,000 people the size of Delaware. The region is officially recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but it is contested and ruled by ethnic Armenians. The two sides have not found a permanent political solution to the conflict, since the war that killed 30,000 or more people ended in 1994 in a truce, leaving open the prospect of renewed, deadly fighting. Stay tuned to find all about the conflict. The worst-case scenario emerged this September after the former Soviet territories accused each other of unprovoked attacks. On September 27, 2020, Armenia announced that Azerbaijan's military had bombed civilian settlements in Nagorno-Karabakh, including the regional capital of Stepanakert. In response, the Armenian Defense Ministry reported that it had killed two Azerbaijani helicopters and three drones. Azerbaijan did not take that lightly, with its defense ministry announcing that it conducted a counteroffensive with tanks, warplanes, artillery rockets, and drones. Past skirmishes have lasted no longer than a few days, but this one has only persisted and escalated. Stepanakert, a city of more than 50,000 people, has endured heavy artillery fire from Azerbaijan since October 2nd, while Azerbaijan claims that Armenia has shelled the country's second-largest city, Ganja, and other missiles elsewhere, any attack that puts civilians at serious risk. These and other attacks made the last week of September the most aggressive, bloodthirsty, and deadly since the 1994 ceasefire. They already call it the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War, said Roya Talibova, an Azerbaijani who was internally displaced by the brutality of the first war and is now a PhD student at the University of Michigan. What I see now reminds me of what I saw in the 1990s. Turkey, a member of NATO, is only making matters worse. It completely backed Azerbaijan, with analysts alleging that at least 1,000 Syrian fighters have been sent to assist and provide weaponry and training to the country's armies. That's provocative, experts claim, because not only does it fan the flames of war, but it also undermines Russia's power and calming influence over the conflict. There is concern among experts that Moscow could also decide to interfere, a move many believe would exacerbate the situation by pitting NATO allies against Russia, either directly or by proxy. But so far, Russia, which manages the speculating diplomatic process around the country, along with France and the United States, has called for restraint alongside its counterparts. All three countries condemn in the strongest terms the alarming and dangerous escalation of violence in and outside the Nagorno-Karabakh sector, their top diplomats said in a joint statement on Monday, adding that the disproportionate nature of such attacks constitutes an unacceptable threat to the stability of the region. However, such calls might not work this time. Most analysts fear that the fighting will not end until either Armenia gives Azerbaijan a strategic decisive blow, or Azerbaijan recovers much or all of Nagorno-Karabakh and its surrounding regions. When I stated this question to Zara Sinanyan, the Armenian High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, he said bluntly, that's true. If we stop fighting for a second, they're moving all the way to Yerevan, the capital of Armenia added. But Sinanyan also did not deny that Armenia could, if deemed necessary, send its army to Baku. We're going to do whatever we have to do to ensure the safety of our people, he said. We're going to protect ourselves to the last bullet. However, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has said his country was ready for mutual concessions with Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's government did not respond to a request for comments, but the country's president, Ilham Aliyev, has not shown any signs of standing down so far. Nagorno-Karabakh is our territory, he said in a TV address on Sunday. This is the end of it. We've told them who we are. We're chasing them like puppies. While many hope that the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict will freeze again, as recent history indicates, it's becoming more and more likely every day that this is a totally new and ruinous flare-up with no end in sight. Don't discount the possibility of this turning into something much larger, said Kavor Koskania, an expert on the dispute at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Once a conflict like this kicks off, it has a dynamic of its own, and you don't know where it will go. So how did the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict get so bad? The first person to blame for the current conflict was former Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. In 1921, Nagorno-Karabakh was given to Azerbaijan, only to convert it into an autonomous region two years later. The shift would eventually prove troublesome, as the population of Nagorno-Karabakh was over 90% Armenian. On top of that, most Armenians are Christian, while Azerbaijan is a Muslim majority. Thus, Stalin's decision effectively transformed the territory into a Christian-majority enclave in a Muslim-majority country. 
Despite some spat, the situation has never been exceptionally violent. It was only when the Soviet Union started to crumble in the 1980s that nationalist powers on both sides made nagorno karabakh an explosive problem. In 1988, the Assembly of the Region passed a resolution indicating that it formally wanted to enter Armenia, despite its position within Azerbaijan. Three years later, the territory of the breakaway proclaimed itself independent. At that time, Armenia and Azerbaijan were no longer part of the Soviet Union, but rather independent states, allowing them the opportunity to combat Nagorno-Karabakh without the direct interference of Moscow. The war that erupted in 1991 was devastating, leading to more than 30,000 deaths and hundreds of thousands of refugees. When it ended in 1994, Armenia pushed Azerbaijan's forces out of Nagorno-Karabakh and took over approximately 20% of the surrounding territories. The Russia brokered truce has remained in effect since then, but both countries still see Nagorno-Karabakh as a territory worth fighting for. In the case of Armenia, Azerbaijan is an existential danger to the thousands of ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and possibly to the nation itself. For Azerbaijan, having a mountainous enclave back in its fold is an integral part of the concept of Azerbaijan as a country and is also a deeply personal issue for the thousands of internally displaced people scattered throughout the nation. Talibova, a doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan, had grandparents who died while working for IDPs in Azerbaijan and still have aunts who live in such housing. It's a very unfortunate situation to live in, she said. Her family and others fled abuse with just the clothing on their backs and whatever money was in their pockets. You lose hope that you will ever see the land to which you are attached again. That is why experts generally suggest that Armenia is more comfortable with the status quo than Azerbaijan. The place is still run by ethnic Armenians and acts as a shield of sorts and high ground in the event of an Azerbaijani ground attack. Azerbaijan, meanwhile, wants to regain its territories and send thousands of disgruntled, displaced people back to their homes. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, the intergovernmental body, is responsible for finding a diplomatic solution to the conflict by tackling the political status of Nagorno-Karabakh, the return of IDPs, and more. It founded the Minsk Group in 1992 with Russia, France, and the United States as co-chairs. They've failed so far to broker an agreement, despite their strength. Most of that, analysts say, has to do with politics in both countries. The people in both countries want their governments to stop at nothing to regulate Nagorno-Karabakh. They look at the past with a telescope and the future with a microscope, said Daniel Bayer, OSCE ambassador from 2013 to 2017. This helps understand why two big diplomatic pushes have failed. In 1997, Armenia and Azerbaijan agreed to a step-by-step -step strategy, whereby Armenia would first partially withdraw from the territory surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. Separatist leaders opposed the idea, but the then-president of Armenia, Levan Ter Petrosyan, completely backed it. His patronage led to a major rebellion within his administration, and he resigned due to pressure in 1998. Three years later, the Minsk party held a summit in Key West, Florida. What they decided is still officially unclear, but the general perception is that Azerbaijan has vowed to hold a referendum on Nagorno-Karabakh. When Azerbaijan's president, Haydar Aliyev, the current president's father, returned to Baku, he was told that going through it would lead to a widespread uprising. Then, he walked away from the contract. Since then, almost no progress has been made, and the co-chairs of the Minsk party have diverted their focus elsewhere, leaving the open wound to fester. However, James Warlick, U.S. co-chair of the Minsk Group from 2013 to 2016, said that the talks had a moderating impact. The diplomatic path has succeeded in several ways, he told me. We've prevented a larger war and kept a lid on the hostilities. The small hope in that truce, the two countries had resolved their immediate differences before the situation spiraled out of control. Neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan want a wider war, Warlick said. The problem is the current fight isn't following that playbook. Instead, the crisis is only getting worse and worse.